So I am not cool enough to, to be like Jacob and not use any like help. So uh, <laughs> bear with me, bear with me. I, and then again, I'm not doing this as a full-time job either. So I, I'm, in fact, also a student. Um, so yeah, I'm, uh, people are probably asking, who am I? Why am I here speaking? Um, like, I'm not you know, a missionary to gamers. I'm not a game developer. I'm a guy. I'm a student. I don't, I don't have a master's degree. I have a bachelor's degree in theater, for what it's worth. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so. So yeah, I am a student at Covenant Seminary, um, and my goal is to eventually be a pastor. I am obviously not there yet. Um, but I grew up playing games. And when I say I grew up playing games, I, I want you to think way back to the Dark Ages. And when, when I was a very small child, my father decided he wanted to get a, a supercomputer to one-up his, his younger brother, who was a computer scientist, he wanted to get a way better computer than his brother just to show off, you know, older brother things. So, so he went, and, and he was living in Tokyo at the time. There's another story. Um, but he went to, a, to have a guy to have him build the computer. And he said, this is what I want. I want a computer that will have four megabytes of RAM. And it will have 40 megabytes of hard drive space. That's like one Word document. Uh, <laughs> so, so this is what he got. And the guy thought he was crazy. He was like, this, this is way too much for a computer. You will never use any of this. Stuff. Like, this is, it's like a waste. It's a waste. You might as well build three or four computers with this. You, know, you don't need all that stuff. N not in your life. You know, not, not in the next 60 years. So of course, here we are 25 years later. And yeah, that's, that's not worth anything. Uh, <laughs> So, so there was that. Um, so as, as a kid, as a little kid, I would like sit and play games like King's Quest and Space Quest with my dad. Um, on my fifth birthday, I got, um, it was Eco Quest. It was a new, brand new Sierra Quest game. Um, and then as, also as a kid, about when I turned six, my parents decided that their three boys, I was the middle of three, were old enough to start playing Dungeons and Dragons. And so as a family, my dad would be the, the game master, and then there would be the three kids and my mom, who were the players, and we played Dungeons and Dragons together as a family. This was like, oh, once every two weeks or so, we'd get together and spend a couple hours in the evening playing a game together. This is probably really weird, I know, but that, 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 this was my childhood. This was my childhood. Um, and so, so yeah, so I, I grew up playing games. I, um, you know, my siblings and I bought, you know, went in together, bought a Nintendo 64 when that, right when that came out, got Mario 64 with the 3D graphics and all of those things. Um, then in high school, I started playing online games, uh, Guild Wars 1, uh, then uh, Lord of the Rings Online. Um, now I'm playing uh, Guild Wars 2 with my wife, among other, other things. Um, so, so this is who I am, and this is why I'm talking about gaming and community, because I know a little bit about it from personal experience. So then the big question is, what on earth does gaming have to do with community? When, so like we saw with, uh, with Jacob's comment, we had that little, the guy who was smoking with the beer and the grease, and no one's going to want to hang out with that guy. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I, I don't care like, like how scruffy of a guy you are. You don't want to hang out with that guy, right? Or you think of the guy who's, it's like 3 a.m., he's in his basement, he's, uh, his eyes are bloodshot, and he's like on the computer or playing the Xbox or whatever by himself at 3 in the morning. You know he's going to wake up at noon and then probably get up and in his PJs play some more Halo or something. So, so what do these two things have to do with each other? Now, first of all, I think we would all agree that community is important. You guys all, all came. You, di you didn't stay home in your basements and play games by yourself. <laughs> Uh, so so that's, that's a good thing. Um, you know, people were made to be in relationship with one another. That, that's the way we were made, to be with one another, with, you know, in relationship with God. Um, and so different people spend time together in different ways. Um, and one way that people spend time together is playing games. Um, for me, it was playing games with my family. You know, we, and now it's still playing games with my family because my wife Tiffany and I play games together. We, we play board games together. We play video games together. We play online games together. It's just it's something that we do as a family. Um, we 
have learned a lot about ourselves and each other through playing games together. I know this is kind of weird, but we communicate better because we played Lord of the Rings online together and did really hard things and had to say, why are you doing that? And started learning how to talk to each other. <laughs> it, it makes a big difference, it does. You have to understand what the other person is doing and know how to tell them what you're doing. And so you have opportunities to really learn about you know, who we are and how we communicate um, and, and really grow together. And then, um, now I, I wanna say, having sitting to, together with someone and having coffee or eating dinner together or whatever, those are very good things too. But there's something about a shared experience that is just amazing. And that's what you get from playing a game together it's, oh look, remember that time we did this really ridiculous thing for, it took us like three hours, but we, we did it, we worked really hard and it was crazy and there was like adrenaline and you were sweating and you know, and it's like, you know, wipe your head. It's like, it's like doing a sports team. In the same way a sports team is, feels close together because they did things together. When you play games with your family, you have those family connections and memories of doing these things together. So sure, we went to Mount Rushmore and you know, we took all the pictures of that and you didn't take any pictures of us playing games, but people remember both. So um, ex on top of that, it's an opportunity, especially online games, are an opportunity to play games with your friends and with your family who are not here with us. Yeah, I'm, we're from Seattle. Our family and friends didn't all move here with us. We still have family and friends over there. Uh, we can play games with them, even though it's a 30-hour drive to get there. And, or, you know, a $400 plane ticket. Instead of having to do that, you can get on the computer and play a game together and have shared experiences. Uh, Tiffany's brother um, is currently deployed in Kuwait with the Air Force. We're able to occasionally get online with him and play a game together on opposite sides of the world. He and his wife get to play games together from opposite sides of the world. Yes, they also get on Skype and have conversations and enjoy each other's company talking, but they get to do both because of games. Now, so then there's that awkward internet people, right? You know, uh, playing games with people you haven't met in person, it's your internet friends, we don't really like to talk about those people because we're friends with them, but, but no one else knows about them because they're online, right? So they're, they're the awkward people who are probably all serial killers and <laughs> want to rape you, and I, I don't know whatever else, and you know. So this summer, uh, there's someone that I've known playing games online for about seven years uh, that she was driving through St. Louis and she stopped by and uh, Tiffany and I took her out to dinner and we had a great time and we just chatted about life and all sorts of different things. And Kelly is an awesome person that I met through playing an online game with. Okay. And uh, Guild Wars 1 and then Guild Wars 2. Um, and so that would have never happened if, you know, if we hadn't had that. So we met in person because we met online. And now, so there's, but there's a question, like I kind of hinted at, that what do you do with, you know, they're creepers, you don't really know, what if, what if they're trying to stalk you or whatever? But actually, Kelly said something that was really useful for, for Tiffany and I both. Um, the same rules apply as in real life. If you spend some time with a person online for a little bit of time, you can really tell if they're slimy or not. Do they act like a real person or do they not? It's, it's not rocket science. You don't, you don't have to be a genius to tell. Now, I'm not saying go to an online chat room, meet someone next day, go, you know, go hang out with them. That's, that's not what I'm saying. But if you spend time together with a person, then you do get to know them, even online. And you know, there's something about being able to do things together with someone without having to go out and, and buy sports gear or movie tickets or game tickets or all these things that you know, you go to a Cardinals game and by the time you've paid for parking and your tickets and you spent like 50 bucks. Or you, you know, spent 50 bucks one time on a game that you've then spent thousands of hours playing versus the three hours of the Cardinals game. That's, that's a big, pretty big difference. Um, so, this all sounds great. So what is wrong with online communities? 
Well, first of all, there's this big word called toxicity, that you have toxic people, you have toxic communities. You have communities full of language, racial slurs, uh, sexual slurs, se sexual orientation slurs. These things are all very real and very existent in online communities. And then you have um, what some people call as elite, or if you see 1337, that might mean something. Um, people who believe that they are always better at, every, at everything than everyone else, and that's how they express themselves online. And if anything goes wrong for them, it's someone else's fault. And, and you know, they'll call people noobs, um, and they'll, they'll get angry, and they'll bully people. They'll, you know, there's all sorts of things, all these things that happen that you'd really expect on an elementary school playground, right? Except for hopefully not quite as much language on the elementary school <laughs> playground. <laughs> Uh, now, now, obviously, this, this behavior is, is not a good thing. It's not something we can say is okay um, and not something that we want to condone ever um, because we know all people are valuable. Uh, we don't want to insult them based on their race or uh, you know, sexual orientation or anything like that. Um, we want to be very intentional about loving people, and it's hard to love someone when all of this racial slur slurs and all this is going on in your community. Um, and you're like, well, why can't we punish them? Well, there's a couple things. First of all, anonymity. People don't have to be known online. If, if I'm online, I can say, it's sort of like your first day at college, and you're like, I can be whoever I want this time. I'm, I'm going to do whatever I want. No one knows who I am. I, I can be free to, to be this way and be really cool or be a jerk. Um, and it's like no one knows how old you are, they don't know what you do for a living, they don't know how much money you make, etc. These can all be really freeing things for people because they're like, well, now I'm not stuck by my social class or gender or color or whatever else, but it can also be just really freeing in a bad way. There, there's, no, uh, there's no consequences. So, you know, in real life, if you have a teenage kid and they start using a bunch of language, you can ground them. They can lose privileges. Uh, they can get suspended from school, there, et cetera. There are so many different things that can happen. You know, adults, they can lose their jobs. They can be sued. They can go to jail. There's, there's all sorts of things that happen when you don't act in appropriate ways. But in a game, the very worst thing that can happen is you get kicked out of the game. They say, you know, the, the people who run the game say, you are misbehaving, we ban you. Your account is suspended from the game, you can't ever play the game again. Except, you can go buy another copy of the game, you can make a new name where no one knows who you are, they don't know that you're that same person as that other person, and you can do it all over again. There, there is no consequences for that. Or you have a group of friends who are like, well, they were stupid for banning you from the game, this game is stupid, let's all go play this other new game that just came out and do the same thing all over again. There, there is a lack of really any kind of authority or consequences within an online world, so people feel free to act in some ways like they, they do when they're driving. You know, you're driving, it's like no one knows you, okay, I, I'm gonna honk at this person because they cut me off and I'm angry, and you're not worried about, you know, because no one knows who you are. So there's, there's a, a freedom that can be good and can be very, very, very bad. Um, so, so the next question, with, with all of those issues, is, is it worth it? Now, first of all, as I think we've all come to the conclusion by now from Jacob, games are here to stay. You know, there are millions of people playing games every day. Uh, it's becoming more common, not less. Um, you know, with smartphones and all of these other things, now it's easier and easier to play games from, uh, you know, I was uh, waiting for car repairs the other day. And I pulled out my phone and I started playing a game on my phone because I could. Uh, so this is, it's getting more and more and it's easier and easier. So this is something that's going on. The question is, what do we do with it? Well, we want to say that people who are online, people we meet online are still people. They are still valuable. They are still made in the image of God. And so we can't just ignore them. We can't just say this, 
you know, this community is horrible. We're, we're just going to, you know, ostracize ourselves from them. We'll go live in the desert or something. And um, you can't do that. Um, all people have value and they have worth. Um, and while we want a deeper relationship with people than just playing a game online with them and never actually getting to know them better, that is a way to start a relationship with a person. Um, all sorts of different kinds of relationships with people over all sorts of different kinds of games. And that those people are valuable. And those people are people that might not ever know a Christian if we don't play games with them. I had, um, a couple months ago, I had a guy who, he's with the army, he's stationed over in, um, in Asia, um, and he, he found out that, you know, I'm a Christian, I'm going to seminary, and he's like, well, I, you know, I'm a homosexual, how do you feel about that? Uh, because every, you know, Christian that he'd ever run into who was, like, against homosexuality basically said he was, you know, demonic and going to hell and hated him. And I had the opportunity to tell him clearly that I do think he's a person who's valuable and also, no, I don't believe this is right and no, I don't think this is okay, but I'm going to still care about you and love you and play games with you anyway. And that's something this guy may have never experienced in fact, he told me he had never experienced that before in his life. And he wouldn't have experienced that if it weren't for playing an online game with a Christian. So the other thing is, yes, gaming communities have all sorts of problems. It's, it's full of sin. It is a broken part of this world, OK? Because people are broken, and online games have people in them. Um, but there are also a lot of really really amazing things. Um, so I'm just going to take one really cool example. Um, a game I play yeah, two, uh, about two weeks ago in Guild Wars 2, there was an update to the game where they added this really, really tough boss fight. And for you who don't know, a boss fight is basically you have a, a monster in the game that's really, really powerful, is more too powerful for one person or even two or three people to, to defeat on their own. So people have to come together to defeat this boss together. In this case, um, this boss, uh, his name is Tequadl, he's an undead dragon, um, and he takes 100 people coming together to kill. Now, all of those little green lines that you probably can't read are people's um, player names. And so this is just a screenshot of one portion of this fight. Now, this isn't something you could just, you know, each person run up and do their own thing. You have to actually work together. So we had um, like 80 to 100 people on an online voice chat service, talking together, listening to each other, working together to, to win this fight. Only it wasn't just 100 people doing it. You had 50 different servers doing it, meaning at any given time that this is happening, we had you know, 5,000 people doing this at the same time and working together as teams to defeat this. This is um, just an amazing image of people working together to really succeed at something and, and working as a team, not because they were told they had to, but because they are people who are the images of God who believe, do in fact believe in relationships and teamwork and are willing to do that of their own initiative and listen to each other and work together and have uh, ultimately victory because of this. this. This screenshot, just for the record, I took that last night. This was People online playing last night, really together, playing a game and having fun. Um, so with all of that said, what do we do? Well, first of all, participate. Um, whether you're someone who likes to play games um, or you're a parent of kids who like to play games, one of the biggest things you can do is participate. The best way to influence a community is to participate in it, to say, I want to be a part of this community, and I want to change this community for the better. Um, if your children play games, even if you play a little bit with them, that's a chance for you to be a positive role model for them, for how, how to play games in a positive way so that they can see how you do it instead of having that random person online showing them how to play games via you know, cussing or whatever else they happen to do. Um, and what better way to understand what your kids are doing than to do it with them? You don't have to like it. You don't have to do it a ton. But if you just participate a little bit, then you understand. You understand a little bit of what they're doing. Number two thing is, if your kids are playing games, talk to them. 
talk to them about games. Don't just assume that, oh, they're playing games, that's great, or please also don't just assume all games are evil, don't play games. I don't think you'd be here if that were what you assumed. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, uh, so, so you know, talk to them, talk to them about communities in online games. Listen to them about the communities they're participating in. Ask questions and, and really interact with them. Talk to them about what it means to interact in these communities and what are the responsibilities of them as an individual. Because even if you as an individual aren't playing in these communities and your kids are, they can have a positive impact. I know that's, that's strange. Our kids can have a positive impact, but it's true. Uh, and so then the other thing is, do use discretion. Um, if you probably don't want your seven-year-old to go play online games without you know, parental supervision of some sort. Um, and you don't want to even send your 13-year-old to go play games without any discretion of what does the community they're participating in look like. If there is tons of cussing going on in their community, you probably don't want them to be doing that for two hours a day. Uh, that's a lot of... Um, negative influence uh, that is impacting us that we want to think about. Um, you don't want to, you know, you don't, definitely don't want to write communities off, but you do want to use discretion in the same way that you, should, you use discretion about what games you're going to play. Uh, just like I wouldn't have a seven-year-old play Grand Theft Auto V. I, I know it sold, made a billion dollars within a week, but I wouldn't have a seven-year-old play that game. Um, and one big thing is, in the end, you do have to make your own decisions. Um, but make informed decisions. Don't just assume that whatever your kid is doing or what you're doing is fine just because other people are playing it too. Um, you know, and, and definitely don't write uh, the games that kids are playing off just as uh, something kids do. This is something that people have done average length, 12 years, that's more than you know, just what a kid does for a few years and they'll grow out of it. Um, and absolutely participate in, even if you don't play games, participate in people's lives who are playing games and ask them questions. Um, you want to know what people who are playing games, especially your kids, are doing and hearing. All right, um, now I can take a few minutes for a question and answer. So say you want to play Guild Wars 2, and how do you find the clan, or Guild, sorry, Guild, to go about doing that without having any connections in the community? I'm going to get my exercise. So I, I didn't hear the first part of the question. <laughs> Something about like guilds and... Guild okay, so if you... <laughs> okay, so... Yeah, absolutely. We need a glossary of terms. Uh, <laughs> I'm already lost. Yeah, so um, there is, it, it really depends on your situation, exactly how you do it. Um, First of all, obviously, I play Guild Wars 2, so if you wanted to know stuff about Guild Wars 2, please, please feel free to come to me. Um, but also, uh, if you, and that, and that goes for saying people you know in real life, that can make a huge difference for entering an online game. Um, additionally, if you are going via the internet, um, you can, uh, a lot of guilds and stuff have websites uh, you can go to and see sort of what, what they believe um, and see what those things are. Or you can just jump in the game and there are actually hundreds of people who are very willing to answer questions to be very helpful and you can start playing with those people and yes it's scary you know meeting people online you don't know uh, yes ice breaking <laughs> um, but you can you can go on and people will be helpful and even if it's a you know a group of people that you eventually decide these aren't the right people for you to play with you can still go in and interact with those people just be thoughtful about what you're doing and how that's going to impact those people and vice versa. Yeah. Brad Wass. Brad Wass is speaking now. <laughs> Brad Wass in the house. You mentioned the word toxicity. I appreciate uh, toxicity. And one of the issues we deal with in sport is with coaches is that there's so many athletes that are either playing or they're gaming afterwards. And uh, the, the key question that a lot of coaches give is when we coach coaches is how do you deal with toxicity of the, a lot of the players that just seem to, to numb out and don't, how do you deal with the, uh, the addiction issues that a lot of the players seem to have uh, how do you? How would you coach coaches and how to be able to deal with gaming? It's kind of my question. Yeah, 
Yeah, so it, it really depends on, your first of all, your relationship with the person who is having the to toxicity issues. Um, as, as a coach, you often have a unique uh, relationship where you have the chance to really influence someone's life. Um, I'd say the number one thing is start asking them questions, asking them questions about what they're doing and why they're doing it, um, whether that's, you know, specific, um, you know, just uh, apathy or, or language or other things. Um, one of the biggest things that can make a difference in someone's life is asking them questions. Um, in an online community with online people, oftentimes that's less uh, possible unless you already have a relationship with that person. Um, so if there's someone in, you know, talking in a whatever, a, a sort of a global chat where anyone can hear them, um, they're probably not going to respond well to asking questions if they're already spewing off language or whatever. Um, but in a, in a more relationship uh, level, just start asking questions, um, asking them why they're doing why they, what they're doing, you know, what, why are you playing so many hours, uh, you know, what are you doing with the rest of your time, um, or what aren't you doing with the rest of your time. And that's, that's just a huge, um, people, people don't just play games for 40 hours a week or 50 hours a week because that's what they feel like doing. There's something else going on in their lives. Um, people don't start spewing off language because that's just what they do. There is something else going on in their lives. Um, and the big question is just figuring out hmm. what that is. And the biggest thing is ask questions, let them feel, be, you know, feel like they're being heard. And once you've asked questions, then it's a lot easier to speak in someone's life. Okay. All right, uh, my question is um, having dealt with the, uh, the kind of stigmatism we're talking about, and obviously the numbers don't lie now in terms of just, you know, sheer communities that you can be part of, but how would you, how would you encourage someone um, who's either a new, either a new gamer or is maybe going to a new context like high school or going to college, um, who f is facing stigmatism from their community, either from people they meet who, as soon as they learn they're gamer, are already ostracized them, how would you encourage them um, to kind of act in those situations. Well, I personally, I'd say that one uh, really big thing is to remember, to, to remind them that they are not alone. And even though they feel different, um, there are obviously other people who are playing, playing games as well. Um, it's often, a, it's a, a very tricky question because High school is a very ridiculous part of our lives. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so you know, in, in the end, um, one of the biggest things is to say is to participate with them. Honestly, um, if if someone is you know playing a game and feeling ostracized for playing games, if um, other people, other like adults in their lives, people they really respect, also are playing games with them, uh, that does say to them, okay, this is not just a really, really weird thing. All their friends might tell them so, or all the people at school might still tell them so. Um, but, you know, th there are communities of people who, um, who play games. Um, I'm just gonna actually make a shout out to Marcus here. There's a St. Louis board game uh, get together uh, that happens, that he's, he's one of the organizers for, that happens here in St. Louis in like 17 different, you know, 17 different times every month. Uh, that's a lot of people who are playing games, board games, but games together in St. Louis right here. This is not something where you're the weird person all by yourself. Um, and so part of it is um, saying, yes, there are people like me, saying, yes, it is good to be in community with people who do understand me, and also saying, no, I don't want to completely isolate myself from these other people just because they are not um, gamers and don't think it's cool. Yeah. I brought Jacob back up here just because we have enough time to let him be a part of the Q&A time. Um, I wanted to ask a quick question. I hope it's quick. Um, the uh, long story short, as I got back into soccer in my life and being able to play, mostly encouraged by my own desire to engage with uh, people that were outside the church, has been a wonderful thing. And actually there's been community. There, there is, there's community there, uh, the people that I play with. And the exact things that you're describing, I've heard you both talk about, happen on the soccer field and after and before soccer games. Um, at the same time, you know, while I could easily say, 
I could easily use the things that you've talked about to say, hey, you know, I'm going to play soccer for four hours a day, Monday through Sunday. And I'm, you know, because I'm building community and we're, this is, you know, all these good things. I, I've got, you know, children, I've got a wife, I've got a job, I've got, and I've got other things that aren't family and, and, and job related that are important to invest in. And so this gets at kind of the addiction question, but I'm going to, but even not addiction, but how do we be, think wisely about investing time into a good community? Where does it cross the line? Um, especially when it's taking away from other communities and how do you process thinking wisely about that? You should start this one. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, one of the joys that I've gotten to have here in St. Louis is actually working with the homeless community here in St. Louis, um, down at Sunshine, uh, Sunshine Mission for, for almost two years down there. And um, I remember a lot of those guys uh, that were struggling with addictions of various kinds, all sorts of addictions. I'm not going to name them here but all sorts of addictions, more than you could even think. If you think you know about addictions right now, you don't. Um, all sorts of people across this world have to struggle with all sorts of different things. Um, and sin is terrible. Uh, there's, there's no way to describe it other than that. We don't even have words to really describe what it does to people. Um, and addiction is sin. It's a bad thing. It's a, it's a very, very bad thing. Um, so if someone's addicted to something, then um, the gospel has lots of things to say to them. And one of the good news pieces of the gospel to someone that's an addict is that there is someone that is strong enough to pull you out of that addiction. There's someone that's capable of doing that. For us, working with addicts, one of the key features of an addict, one of the defining characteristics, it's really hard to, to pin down who's an addict and who's not. Uh, and it's really hard to define what's a game and what's not. I mean, these really tough questions that we ask, and that's good. Um, but for us down there, when we were helping someone that was an addict, the thing that made someone an addict that we could know, the symptom that we said, all right, we really need to come alongside this person and really help them right now with the gospel and with lots and lots and lots of resources dedicated to getting them out of the, the addiction. The symptom that showed that they were really addicted to something was that it impacted the entire rest of who they were. Every other aspect of their life was impacted because of some addiction. And we know this as gospel workers and as gospel Christians, that we know that when something else takes a hold in our hearts, that is not the gospel, and it takes a hold of our hearts and we want to live our life for it, it starts to impact every aspect of our life. Whether that's a sport, whether that's cheering for a team, whether that's enjoying a video game, or whether that's enjoying a narcotic, or whether that's uh, an abusive relationship all sorts of addictions that we can fall into. And the, the key feature that we identify as an addiction is that it's impacting you the whole rest of your life. And so for gaming addicts, um, it's very clear to see where an addiction comes in and how it's impacting their life. But it's only clear to see if you're willing to ask good questions and if you're willing to really spend time with someone. Because if somebody plays a game for 15 hours a week, there's an instant stigma that they're addicted. If someone read books for 15 hours a week, we call them a seminarian. <laughs> Time spent on task is not the definer of what is an addiction. An addiction is something that has taken root, taken hold of your heart, and now says, this is your Lord. So we as Christians, we need to look and see that because addictions are all over the place. Uh, and identifying them is actually a lot harder than just saying, I'm spending this amount of time on something, but it'll actually impact your whole life. Yeah, I would say that one thing is uh, what are you not doing because you're playing games? Um, who are you not spending time with because you are playing games? Uh, that's, that's one thing that uh, for me specifically with, uh, with my wife Tiffany, the question I'm constantly asking myself is if she needs something, am I willing to exit out of my game no matter what is going on, no matter how close we are to defeating that really awesome boss? Um, and am I willing to stop right now and go help her? If I'm not, why? And that's, that's a huge question. Um, another big thing is, uh, and this is actually really tricky with gaming because of the stigmas, but am I ashamed of this? Am I willing to tell people that I'm playing games? Um, a lot of times, um, I've, I've heard so many stories over the past several years 
of people who no one even knew they played games outside of their family. And then they, you know, they, they came to a pastor or something because their spouse was thinking about leaving them because they weren't being responsible to their families because they were addicted to gaming. Why didn't no one know that they were playing games? Because they were, you know, they were so ashamed of it, they felt like they would be ostracized if they told anyone. That's a great way to fuel an addiction is to not tell anyone about it because then you have no one to keep you accountable. It's the same, I mean, if you think about like having, drinking alcohol, if, you know, if I have beers with friends, if, you know, if I'm okay telling them, I'm probably not, you know, worried that they're going to judge me because I had way too much alcohol and I'm drinking it too much. But if I'm keeping it a secret, there's probably a reason why I'm keeping it a secret. Um, and so those are just a couple of really good questions to, to ask yourself or ask the person. Um, they aren't, obviously they are not a full answer to any of this, but that is, that is a piece of it. So this touches a little bit on what you were just talking about. Um, one of the things that makes video games in particular distinctive from other new art newer, relatively artistic mediums like um, film and recorded music is that video games were first presented as something for children. And so that stigma, I don't know if it, it may be a prejudice, but it, originally they were, you have to admit it. The, these things were marketed and sold as children's toys. That has changed but people's perception in the United States has not changed. People still perceive these things as something for children. And it's, cause, it's caused two problems. Well, first is the one you just addressed. People don't want to admit they play games and they're gamers because it's something associated with uh, Peter Pan syndrome. And the other problem is parents allowing their children to play games that, ought not, that they ought not to play because they associate these things as a children's toy. Well, this is a game. It should be for my children. Um, how do we, especially as Christians, how can we reasonably point out that a medium is not age-specific? And um, because I think that has hurt, um, especially how Christians address this subject, is this idea that this is a thing for children. Um, and it's hurt it in both of those two different ways. I'm not going to record this one. I'm going to use it in this picture. Okay. So, Marcus, this is a fantastic question. So, if Alfa was here, I would I would take a stool and I would say these are both chairs, both chairs. Which of them is good for Alfa? She's a two-year-old. Which of them is good? Anybody got any guesses? You can make it a game show. What do you say, Mark? Small one. Smaller one. All right. Why do you think it's a small one? Because it's smaller and an adult would not sit on. Okay, so I can't sit on this one, but maybe Allie can. All right, that's good. So maybe there's something about the chair that makes it more desirable for her age group or for her side. All right, what else? What else is different about these chairs? Well, I, I, I would argue the other one because he wouldn't fall off. Well, my son would fall off the back. Of that. I mean, I, not that one, but my, my younger one. He would fall off the back of the other one. So this is just a silly illustration to say, is there anything wrong with chairs in general? Because there are some chairs that Alifea should not sit on. I'm not even saying which of these two she should sit on. Is there anything wrong with chairs in general? Do we need to get out our torches and pitchforks <laughs> about chairs? Chairs are bad. My child fell from chairs. Burn the chairs. <laughs> that's silly. Okay, that's silly. And it's silly logic to say that. So just because there are different chairs for different sizes of people, for different butts, for different sizes of butts, for different ages of butts, okay? A good chair fits and it's good. It's a good chair. How we define a good use of a medium should be much the same way. Rather than looking at games and saying, because Grand Theft Auto V exists, my two-year-old can't play an educational game that's taught her sign language. They're both games. They both fit into the broad category. Alifea will never, Lord willing, play Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> <laughs> They're both games. It requires, and it's incumbent on me as a parent, to be wise in my choices and wise in my parenting. And that's really hard.
It is so much easier if I just said, burn the chair! <laughs> and then we could all have a party, we'd burn the chairs, and we'd be done with it. That would be so much easier. But that's not what God does for us. God tells us to look at this world and enter in and to figure out what is good about it and what's got gospel purpose. Hmm. That's what I'm saying. That's good. That's good. Yeah, just ask questions. Please ask questions. That is like, if you don't get anything else, ask questions. Good. Any more questions? No. <laughs> oh, I think I saw your yeah. hand first. Um, one question that I have, I grew up playing sports video games. You name it, I played it. Um, and then I met my neighbor, Alex Schmidt, and I realized, and a, and a few people in our church, there are more board games than sports games that I could imagine. And I fell in love with it. I'm like, all of a sudden, I'm like entering into this world full of board games. And, and that was because I was invited in. But what I've realized is not, not very many people are being invited into gaming, especially gaming that they're not used to. So what I'm wondering from you guys is, as a church, how can we, how can we um, promote gaming and facilitate gaming in a way that is promoting community? How, so I guess I'm thinking of specific initiatives that the church can take to make this happen. Good question. Can I take a shot at that too? Uh, as, a, as, a, as a someone in youth and family ministry for 15 years, that's a great venue. I mean, one of the best things, Mark Robertson, when we were in youth ministry together, we did for the boys uh, especially, was just have a, a gaming night. I mean, we would have a movie night and we would have a go out and, you know, talk, go to get, grab pizza night. But the best attended events that we had were let's play games together, like video games with the boys. And we would spend hours just talking and I had a lot of great, I'm terrible at it. I don't even like video games. One-on-one -on -one conversations while they were doing all kinds of crazy stuff that were just tremendously great. Um, and, and you can get teens to show up and you can get them to bring unbelievers to those kinds of things. Um, so at least in a youth ministry way, people can argue with it and say it's not as good as a Bible study. And, and I would, I'm, I'm, seminary trained and I believe in the power of the gospel and I want my son to be taught scripture absolutely uh, but you will get so many more gospel opportunities by number with unbelievers and with believers in the church if you do if you connect it some way to playing games you know whether that's ultimate frisbee or league of legends I don't know <laughs> that was, name one please name one. <laughs> So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's what he said. You know, the, actually the trickiest thing with talking about the youth group is probably the girls because they all like playing games too. But it's, and, you know, that age group, try getting the girls to admit it. Try getting the girls to show up. Um, you know, they'll, they'll love it if they do, but they don't want to show up, um, at least depending on the community, et cetera. Uh, but uh, so, yeah, as, as far as that goes, it is a huge um, icebreaker. Um, it's a huge, it's a great way to get people to start actually interacting when, uh, you know, you have your, you know, take turns praying uh, and the person's like awkward. I don't, I don't, I don't talk in pe with people. I don't know how to do that. I'm a, you know, I'm a high schooler. I, I don't understand. Take turns playing a game and everyone having to say what they do. They'll, they'll get into that. Even if they, at first they don't, uh, it is teaching them, you know, communication skills. They, they learn how to interact with other people through playing games. Um, it's, so it's a huge part. Um, as far as um, adult community goes, um, it you know a lot of times it is one-on-one uh, -on -one small group discipleship, um, saying, "Hey, you're you know I don't know you. Let's come over. Let's play a game together. You know we don't have to eat dinner and play a game. We can just play a game together. Oh, church is over. We had lunch. Uh, let's go play a game together. Uh, things like that. So just really inviting people in as individuals. It's in a lot of ways it is a grassroots thing um, because people do love playing games but they don't necessarily know how to start and who to play with. Yeah, all right, so I'm the drama king, so I get to be dramatic. This is what I tell pastors when I call them up. When I say, hey, we're gospel and gaming, and we want to talk to you about what the gospel has to say about gaming. And they say, okay, what do you do? And I say, could you imagine... And this is both serious and humorous. So if you laugh, that's fine. If you weep tears, that's fine too. 
Imagine what would have happened if the church would have embraced Pokemon. Okay, what does that even look like, Jacob? Like, what, what do you even mean? What would have happened if the church would have been the safe place to come and play? What would have happened if the church was the place where we all gathered together to play our tournaments? What would have happened if the church would have been an okay spot for our youth group kids to actually hang out with adults, be in the same intergenerational room, and say, hey, I just got, I don't even know, Charizard. (laughs) Dude, I got the holographic Charmander. Awesome. Okay, what would the church have been like if we would have been behind Pokemon? That doesn't mean that we have to include in our mission statements or our faith statements that this is our clan that we play on, this is the server that we play on, and these are the cards that are appropriate and these are the cards that aren't. We don't have to do that. There's not a bunch of extra work that we need to put in that way. But it's just like what Mark said and just like what Alex said. This is a tremendous opportunity that's there. The Lord has been preparing this field. The question isn't whether the Lord's doing this work. The question is, is how is he calling you into it? It's not whether it's out there. It's out there. It's how are we going to go out and work it for the Lord's purposes. That's the question. 